Good evening everyone, this is Sam. For today's video, we're gonna be going over a subject that is very important and also defines the Ranger class as different from any other in the game, that is to say, the pet system. We can Now, pets in Gear Wars 2 are not only supposed to be the companions that are going to be fighting alongside the ranger, but also became with the soul beast the skills that the ranger uses themselves. At this point in the game, it is important, in my opinion, to have a solid understanding of which pet does what and which pet can be useful in which situation. There are some very specific encounters in which having a different pet might mean getting the upper hand or not. Having an edge on whatever content you're about to do with proper pet management in both choices and micromanagement of pet skills is extremely valuable and I think that throughout this guide you might be able to learn some stuff that you didn't know before. The first thing I should be doing when it comes to talking about the pet is mentioning that you will not get every single one of them by playing the game. Think about the pets that you're gonna be only able to get through Guild Wars 1. These pets are the Juvenile Black Moa, the Juvenile White Raven and the Juvenile Black Widow Spider. These three pets can only be obtained if you go into the specific Guild Wars 1 veteran area of Guild Wars 2. I believe the name is the Hall of Monuments and you need to have a certain amount of points in order to be able to get the pets. Now, that does not mean that you should be rushing ahead and grab an old copy of Guild Wars 1 from whichever store you might be thinking of. It only means that if you want to have the truly best pet for some very specific cases, then yeah, you might play Guild Wars 1. But in all honesty, you can do just fine as a ranger slash druid slash soul beast without any of these. Now, in order to probably classify the pets, there are some steps we will be needing to take. We could be classifying the pets by family, and that's actually what we're going to be starting with, because it is a good idea. But we're also, throughout the video, going to be classifying the pets depending on the skills that they can use or not, and also depending on what they give to the ranger player, because this is also what matters. But first, let's go over the different types of pets we have, and what they can do specifically. As an introduction, we'll first have to say that there is a little bit of distinction between pets simply on where you can use them. Some pets have dimension terrestrial, some pets have dimension amphibious, and obviously the pets that you can use underwater, well, they're pretty much aquatic. So, these three types of pets determine where you can use them. Terrestrial is land only and aquatic is water only. In the amphibious pets, you can pretty much use them in any of the both, which is pretty interesting because I didn't know that the tiger could hold their breath for over an hour. But well, you know, it doesn't have to be realistic. So, now that we have this preliminary knowledge, let's divide the pets into families. So, the, the families of pets are rather simple. You have the armored fish, which only has one pet. The bears, the birds, the bristleback, which also only has one pet. Canine, devourer, drake, feline, iboga, also one pet. Jacaranda, also one pet. Jellyfishes, moa, porcine, raw gazelle, again one pet. Shark actually also one pet. Smoke scale, well, duh, only one pet. Spiders and wyverns. So this is all the different families of pets that we have, and in them we have distinction between each and every single one of the pets. The main distinction that we can do for the pets is our specific beast skill. That is to say the one you can use. So. Every single one of these pets that falls into different families, for example, this is a moa, uh, this is a bear, obviously, this is feline, this is also feline, this is a canine, this is a drake, this is a bird, like, I mean, come on, it's pretty obvious when you look at them. 
and each of them has a specific different F2 skills. For example, for this MOA, which is funnily enough called Protection Uptime, it actually gives protection. For this other MOA here, it is a screech that does days, I say crowd control. With, uh, let's say, this Drake, we're gonna be getting bolts of lightning that bounce on enemies, so that's purely damage. But then again, if we take the uh, Reef Drake, we get Confusion, and if we take the Salamander Drake, we get Burning. So, each of the pets has a different F2 skill, and it is very interesting for you, as a Ranger player or an aspiring Ranger player, to pay attention to what each and every single pet can do. This is especially important when you're going to be needing to switch the pets in and out depending on encounters. In my opinion, a very good idea would be to just cycle through every single one of the pets and look at what they can do. So just take each pet, check them one by one, look at what they do, write them somewhere for a very special notebook and be like, this pet is good here. But actually, I'm going to be saying that in the video at some point, we're going to be going over what pet I think is relevant in each popular fractal slash raid encounter. So if you don't want to do your own research by looking at every single one of the pets, you can just skip ahead to the timestamp that is written down on the video right now somewhere, and it's going to take you exactly where you want to. Now that we have defined the pets by families, I believe it is going to be relevant to look at what we have as other means of distinctions of every pet. So, the good one about that is that Soul Beast is a class that gives you a different insight on how pets work. On the basic of a pet, you have four skills. The four skills are the following ones, with the one shown first always being the one you can choose to activate on your own. The other skills that the pets have are usually its auto attack, and two other skills that are on a cooldown. Pretty interestingly, the last skill that a pet has most often gets used right away after the pet is swapped. That is to say that the longest cooldown skill of your pet is gonna be one of the first ones that is gonna be used after a swap. This is particularly interesting because there are some specific actions that you might want to trigger at some points or not. For example, on Drake, you have a combo finisher blast when you swap it. And that means that if you have a field that is up, let's say a water field or a fire field and you're in the middle of combat, you swap to a drake, you get a blast in it. That's pretty good, although pretty useless. Because in encounters where you get in combat, you're not going to be able to swap the drake out and we've got a lot of better pets to use. So all in all, there is very little reason for this one. But in other cases, for example, the Rock Gazelle, it means that you get the charge after the pet swap. You could be cleaving these guys down in PvP before they even get the idea to try and rest themselves. But now is not the time for this. We are going to be looking at the other thing that interests us, which is what they do when you're a Soul Beast. So, Soul Beast brings us two different things from the pets. First one is a set of skill, second one is an attribute boost. So as I have said, the family has a direct impact on what the pet does once you become a soul beast. So depending on each and every family of the pets, you're gonna be getting the defining skills. That is the first two. So the first two are always tied to the family of the pet. For example, in this case right now, I have a rock gazelle. It has a kick and it has a charge, and that's pretty good. But if I swap to a different pet, for example a MOA, the first two skills are gonna be different, as you can see right there. So you can actually heal yourself in nearby allies, and you can also attack with a frenzy. This is the skill of this pet, but if I swap to another MOA, these two are the same. They're tied to the family. So whichever more I get, obviously I'm gonna always have these first two skills. And this is relevant for every pet in any family that you have out there. For example, if I take a dog, I have these two. If I take another dog, I have the same two. So this is the first point. The second point that we get is the archetype of the pet. The archetype of the pet decides the attribute boost you're gonna get and also decides the third skill you're gonna be having. So, 
The archetypes are of a number of five. Each of them has a very cool name. So for example, for this one we have versatile, but the other ones happen to be stout, deadly, ferocious and supportive. The different buffs that we get from them are very simple and I'm going to be going over them right now so that you guys can follow up on how it works. So let's take a bear. The bear gives us stout and that's a toughness and vitality buff. It makes you more tanky, which is not going to be especially useful in PvE, but you know, everything can have its own uses. It also gives you unflinching fortitude. Shrug off all movements in pairing conditions and become unflinching in the face of normal attacks. Normal attacks means the normal damage type attack. So if you get a condition damage attack, you're still going to be affected by it. And the conditions are removed, but they can be reapplied. So it only removes them temporarily. Still, that is pretty much the same effect as what you would get from a Signet of Stone. Signet of Stone being this one, that makes you take no damage from attacks and, as said, still susceptible to conditions and control effects. This is overall pretty good if you're going to be playing PvP or Web vs. World, although I think that there are some much, much better skills out there to take before going for this. Then we can have a look at our dear friend, the Morello, which is going to be giving us an idea of Deadly. So Deadly gives you an improved condition damage and precision. This is especially what you would be looking at if you're going to be playing Condition Soul Beast, because you want these two attributes to be boosted. The skill that you get from that mode is the Primal Cry, so think Winston from Overwatch. But what is very interesting about this skill is that it's only on a 20 second timer, which makes it really useful. It has a radius of effect, you don't need to be exactly standing on top of your target to use it. And it also means that it is pretty useful in AoE to cleave down. It gives 3 stacks of leading for 11 seconds, that is pretty damn fucking awesome. And it also gives a little bit of vulnerability at 9 stacks. Overall, this is what we look for in a pet that we're going to be using in a PvE scenario. And this is also what you can be looking for if you're going to be playing any condition-based soul beast in PvP or World of World. This is extremely good and I think that if you want to practice your damage inducing rotations, this is the kind of pet you should be looking into. Obviously not by taking the Morello, but instead by going for example for the Iboga or the Lynx. Now, the third different archetype of pet that we're going to be looking for is, let's go very easily, for the Polar Bear. So, Versatile. Versatile is a boost to Vitality and Concentration. Vitality and Concentration being two attributes that actually don't have much of a use on a Soul Beast. You're not going to be playing as a boon giver for the entirety of your team, most reasonably because you do not actually give that many boons to the team, unless you're playing with nature's magic, and this is pretty much a waste of your damage. So this is not something that I would deem to be particularly useful in the PvE scenario, however some people might be wanting to look into it to make a support soul beast build work. I currently have one that I am trying to work on, but it is not working on by itself, so I will need to finish videos such as this one before I can get to it. The ability you get from this one is the Prelude Lash. So this doesn't seem like it is very good, I mean the damage looks Kinda of stale, the immobilize doesn't even last that long, the cooldown is actually 25 seconds, that, that doesn't look good, you know? But it is a 300 range pool and it is affecting 5 targets. That is actually pretty good because it is the first time that Ranger has gotten an AoE pool and a pretty decent one at that. So this is very specific scenario wise once again because I mean, you could probably use this when you're at Sloth to gather the Sloblings if your Mesmers are not up to the task. But what is pretty good about it is that the Juvenile Electric Wyvern, this pet right here, the one that we use as the CC pet most of the time, is also one from this archetype. So you're getting the Pro Lash from it, which also gives you some extra CC. This is very useful and you should be looking into it for your daily PvE. Plays. Now, for the next two archetypes, we are going to be looking at the Juvenile Arctodus. So, Ferocious. Ferocious. 
200 power, 100 ferocity. This is amazing. This is actually great. This is brilliant for power type damage. Like, power and ferocity are the two stats you want to get some of, because, well, precision, you don't need it. You're capped on the critchins. Now, what we get as a skill from it, on a 25 second cooldown, we have the Whirly Impact. 1.7k damage as a base. So, that is actually quite a bit. 1.7k is great, and usually this is a hard-hitting skill of the likes of Maul. Now, it has a bit more of a cooldown, but it is still very useful, and I am currently using pets that have this skill when I play PvP. The reasoning behind it is that a huge burst of damage is usually what it takes to take that pesky spellbreaker directly from alive to down and then dead. Now, the radius is 240, which means that you don't need to be standing right on top of your target, and it is also a combo finisher leap! Man, isn't this great! It means that you can use this in a field in order to get some buffs on yourself, and a good example that I would guild would be to use it with a smoke scale because the smoke scale actually is of that specific archetype now for the last archetype that we have i'm going to be going over to our best friend the epitome of ranger pet plays the one true leader of the pack the amazing brown bear so the brown bear is of the supportive archetype and what it can do is give you an attribute increase to vitality and a healing increase per target. Well, what does that mean? That means that you heal more. Brilliant. That's great, right? That's amazing. And you have extra vitality, like, man, like, like these extra HPs, that they're good. I mean, if you merge, it's actually an extra thousand health. And this is not too bad, you know? The skill that you get with it is Spiritual Reprieve. It's on a 40 second cooldown. That might seem like quite a lot, but when you look at what the skill does, you will just understand how great it is. A heal for 4.2k, that is almost as much as your healing skill does at 6.5k, because you have to look at the fact that you're gonna be merged in order to use it, and once you merge, it actually is increased due to the beast mode. I mean, this one is also increased, but it is pretty damn good as a standalone healing skill. If we unmerge slightly, we're gonna be able to look at it a little bit longer. It also gives you resistance. Resistance is great in PvP. Right now we're facing a pretty Condi heavy meta, so because we have the Scourgette, we have Condi Thieves that still haven't disappeared even with the X-Pack, man! And we also have some remnants of the old Condi warrior meta. However, spellbreakers are getting the upper hand on that one and their powers, so this might not be the best pick for you. Still, this skill is very strong and it also heals your allies. I cannot emphasize enough of that, but right now if you're playing Soul Beast in PvP, a lot of people are gonna be like, can't you go Druid? You can still do some sort of support by using skills like this one. This is not the only skill that has such a positive impact on your team as a whole. And if you are using this in a team fight, your people will love you. Also, you can double the duration of that resistance by using the MOA stance before. Now that I have gone over all the pet families and archetypes, I think that it would be rather relevant to look at some specific pets that have caught my attention in regular play. These specific pets I'm going to be doing a quick overview of and then explain why I choose them and in which circumstances. As such, I will not be going over every single one of the pets in the game, I'm only going to be going over the ones that are used in regular play. If you want to have more details about a specific pet, you're more than welcome to contact me on our Discord, in-game, or on Twitter. There is no problem about this and you should feel free to ask any question, however stupid it might seem to you, because no question is ever stupid. The first contender is a Juvenile Pink Moa. 
So Juggernaut Pink Boy is one of the most used CC pets in the game. The reason behind this is that you have a 2 second daze on a 30 second cooldown. This is extremely good and there are many reasons in the world as to why you would use this one. I personally play with the Pink Moa in encounters where bosses have a small hitbox because the Wyvern tends to somehow slip through the enemy a bit too far and miss part of the CC. As such, this pet sees a lot of plays in small hitboxes, fights, beating raids, fractals or Dungeons? Like, dungeons are still relevant, man. Haven't you watched my Twitch? So that was for the first pet. For the second pet, however horrible that might seem, and this is making me feel really bad, if you ever need a tank in your life, the brown bear has got it for you. If you look at this vitality, 4.9k! Man, it has 52,000 health! This is so huge! And yeah, this pet is indeed a tank of its own. It has a lot of health and you can be using it as a replacement in fights where a tank is rather useful. So for example, before in a time long forgotten by any of us, we used to have these pets tank at all time in fractals. Now it's not as relevant as before, but these pets can still see some plays when you're pogging in fractals and you really need something to divert the aggro from the rest of the team. Of course, if you are trying to be a better player or playing in an organized group, please do not bring a brown bear. Still, it deserves its spot on the list. For the next one, we're going to be going for Juvenile Jungle Stalker. It is one of the pets that you start the game with. For example, for this one, it says to me, he's been with you as long as you can remember. And this is a brilliant love story, and I think that this is romantic. And nobody can tell me that I am not allowed to find this amazing. Anyways, back to the matter at hand. The pet skill is giving extreme might to nearby allies. So what that means is that it gives 15 seconds of it on a 25 second cooldown. Uh, it has 3 seconds of cast time during which your pet can be interrupted. So yeah, it's not too good, but if you are playing with a subpar condition PS or even power PS, uh, I mean, they died, but you know, sometimes they can come back, just like the necros in PvP. Anyways, this pet gives 5 stacks of might, and if your PS struggles to upkeep 25 might, you can always supplement it by playing with it. This for this reason, Mine is called Might Spencer. Now, the other skills are the maging ones, which means that if you're playing with this pet, you're not really losing out on the damage output. For the next pet, we're gonna be going over the Lynx. The Lynx used to be, I'm saying used to be, but it's still, actually it is still quite relevant. It used to be the highest single target DPS pet. So, with the rending pounds, it dealt a lot of bleeding damage as well as power ones, and the other skills are that of the Felin family. This pet was highest DPS pet on every single encounter, even at bosses that do not benefit from playing Kondi. A lot of people were running the Lynx as their primary pet for that specific reason. Now, if you do not have unlocked the other pets from Path of Fire, the Lynx remained the main one when it comes to DPS. Later on in the video, there is gonna be a more specific and detailed guide on what pet can do which DPS. Please look into this one. For our next contender, there is Juvenile Tiger. Juvenile Tiger is what used to be the primary supply of Fury. The reason behind that was that before we got onto a conditioned PS main meta, we used to have this to provide Fury, while now it has been done by using the for great justice shout. This pet is very good because on a 10 second cooldown you have a huge damaging ability and the rest of the pretty good DPS abilities of the Philian family that I do not need to present over and over again. So this pet was also one of the main DPS pets, however it is currently being trumped by the Iboga that will be going on later on. Our next contender on the list is the Juvenile Wolf. So. This pet does fear, and the reason why this is particularly useful is that there are some encounters where you want the mobs to move. A long time ago, in a galaxy far far away, Sor's Embrace was the place for it. In Path 3, it was relevant to use fear, sometimes on Warrior, to push the trash mobs under 
the structure so that you could DPS the dredge car. Now it is not as known as before because people are mostly not running the dungeon anymore, but also because warriors can just take fear me. If you want to use that pet, that means that the warrior can bring another DPS utility, for example a Signet of Might, and they're gonna be pretty damn happy with it. This pet is also pretty relevant if you're gonna be doing towers on escorts with a low man subgroups as three or four people, because if you're using the Glyph of Tide followed up by the fear as you land, that means that you're pushing the mobs to the edges and keeping them down in there so that you can instantly cap the tower. This has a lot of beneficial usage and I think that you guys should be looking into that specific pet if your team is struggling at escort or if you want to make it smoother as a whole. The reason behind it is that you are not going to be needing any DPS pet as the only thing you're going to be killing until you get to Maclead is just the trash mobs on the towers. Anyways, let's move on to our next duke. So right now we don't exactly have anything useful. We used to have the Fairhound that was somehow decent at some point because it gave a lot of regen but you know... I mean, the Signet of Inspiration memes meant that you usually wouldn't get the upper hand on your Rage Duration on the Chronomancer and as such, you know, I wouldn't exactly say that you should be playing this pet. So we're moving on to the Juvenile Jungle Spider because it has an Immobilize. So I was talking about Escort just before. Escort on the towers can be using the Wolf and Escort down on the ground can be using the Juvenile Jungle Spider. It is a pretty alright DPS pet when it comes to condition damage. It is not great but it is okay-ish. However, it has Immobilize on a pretty decent timer. So here you have 3 seconds every 45 seconds, which is not totally relevant, but here you have over 5 seconds on a 20 second cooldown. That means that if you are on backward duty, you can pretty much root them in a specific spot and keep them killed there with your condition. The second thing that you should be looking at is the fact that on the third skill in the bar, you also have Immobilize again. So this pet is basically the Immobilize bot, and it is pretty damn good for that. And you should be using this pet if your team struggles with backwards and you want to actually take care of it and make sure that your rest goes smoother. You can also use this pet if you're gonna be with the team down there and doing the front wars because you need to keep them away from Glenna, our lord and savior. Now we move on to the last few pets of the list as we get to the pigs. For example, if you take the juvenile pig, it has a very funny skill which is forage. The forage skill is probably one of the most meme-ish in the game because it allows you to find a random item on the ground. So I'm just gonna do a small demonstration because it's actually very fun. So for example, here I got the elixir of heroes, which is gonna make me invulnerable. This is one of the good ones that you can get, the best one being the plasma that gives you a copy of every single boon in the game. However, this is pretty damn fun if you're gonna be just memeing around between PvP or War vs. War because who doesn't like a bit, a bit of randomness in their gameplay? Well, the pig is there for you. Now, for the next pets that I think are relevant, we have the juvenile electric wyvern. So juvenile electric Three women is the one that I have right here, so I actually need to press F4 for it, F4 being the key to swap pets. And on this one, which is casually named What is CC, well, you have crowd control. It does a zero launch, but it still does pretty decent CC. And you also have another CC skill on the wing buffet. Actually, I think that's pronounced buffet, but dude, like, come on, it's 3 a.m. I'm supposed to have third data right now as a hobbit. So yeah. When you merge with it, you also get crowd control on two of the skills, which makes it very relevant in any encounter that you're going to be needing crowd control for and where the target is at least medium or big size hitbox. So for example, this is very good if you're going to be playing at Samurog. Like Samurog, you need to CC regularly. This is brilliant at doing the job. And you should be trying it if your team is having difficulties. And even if they don't, like as a ranger or a soul beast or druid, you should always have one DPS slash utility pet and one CC pet. If your team is struggling with CC, you would be running both the pink Moa and this one in order to be able to do most braver damage as you can. The reasoning behind it is that if you have a mechanic that relies on crowd control and you fail it, then it is pretty much the fault of the entire team and if you could be saving the day, you should be doing it. Guild Wars 2 is a team game before anything, so if you do not pull your weight plus a little bit of the others, then you're not making it as smooth as you could and you should be ashamed of it. Now, for the next pet on the list, we have the Bristleback. 
So the Bristleback has pretty damn good damage when it comes to PvP. This skill used to be the best one to use before it's nerfed because you could literally meme the shit out of people by using it at the right time. Using a Beast Mastery based build gave you a lot of improvements on this specific skill and allowed you to one shot the unsuspecting foe. Right now it is being trumped by other pets but that does not mean that the Bristleback is useless. This specific skill that is given to the Bristleback family when it comes to soul beasting around is very useful as it is a similar precast to the sharpening stone. I've already mentioned this in a previous video but this can be precast before raid encounters if you're the last one to ready up. I think that it is particularly useful and you should be doing it at any occasion that you get because it is gonna be giving you an upper hand in your regular gameplay. For the next pet, we have the Juvenile Smoke Scale. The Juvenile Smoke Scale also has its own specific sets of skills. The Smoke Salt is the skill that allows you to port onto your enemy and finish moving at their new position, and it also gives you an evade. That's pretty damn good. Then you also have the knockdown, which is a very good CC. And CC is one of the things that this pet is good at. The knockdown on takedown is particularly strong, but what is truly the best about it is the smoke cloud. This is a smoke field that lasts 5 seconds that people in your team can blast. That means that if you are doing fractals and lacking a thief, or if you are doing any sort of dungeons and also lacking a thief, you can be blasting this one specific field otherwise. For the next pet we're going to be going over, there is the Jacaranda. The Jacaranda is truly my number one pick from the Path of Fire expansion. Like, truly this pet is making my day anytime I play PvP. So, it has that spiritual reprise skill that I talked about, which is very strong. And it also has Thighs, which gives you a very strong heal and regen. But what truly makes it good is that it has a decent immobilize, a pretty good timer as well as vulnerability, plus that thing deals damage. It also has, and that is truly the strongest skill, the Coal Lightning. So Coal Lightning is a skill that does 5.2k damage and gives vulnerability on a 10 second cooldown. This I believe makes it the single target highest DPS pet of all and we are going to be testing that later on in this one in order to show everyone the DPS specific potential of the pets that I have handpicked. It also has its own healing skill which makes it a little bit more durable in PvP or versus world although it is not particularly relevant as the pet usually does not die unless you make a mistake. The last two pet that we have and we're going to be presenting are the Fang the Boga that does a pretty hefty amount of condition damage also here and also happens to be the pet that gives you the single best damage when it comes to soul beasting around. This skill is a little bit hard to implement in your rotation due to the fact that it is on a very small cooldown and actually has a cast time however the other two skills are particularly good when it comes to DPSing. If you have any doubts about how to use them you're more than welcome to look at the rotation that I have made and use the pet skills just like you would use on the links however for the first skill you need to use it after you do the swap to dagger, torch, with uh, as I said the double arc and throw torch then use the pet skill do an entire auto attack chain use the pet skill again basically that's how you use it when you are on short bow and have done your two good attacks you can pretty much supplement auto attacks with that skill it is very strong the Iboga definitely is one of the best DPS pets when it comes to soul beasting and you should be looking into it if you have any desire to be the number one. The last pet that we're going to be talking about is the Rock Gazelle. So the Rock Gazelle is currently broken in PvP. As I have said before, when you swap to a pet it usually starts with casting its fourth skill and the charge on the Gazelle has this very specific thing that it instantly cleaves down the downstate targets in the enemy team. Its work out there is very simple, the charge hits multiple times which is what causes the spikes in damage that you can sometimes see for up to 60,000. So this pet is currently a little bit broken but in my opinion it shouldn't get fixed because actually it's very easy to dodge, it's only gonna finish someone when they are in downstate, I haven't been able to replicate the multi-hit charge on anything that was in downstate and it's also after all is a pet skill. It's not something that you decide to use which means that counterplay can definitely be happening especially if you're being killed before and pretty much 
makes it decent and not OP. The other skills of the pet give it pretty decent damage and a pretty decent CC. CC that you can find also here on the charge on a 12 second cooldown. In my opinion, the Gazelle is a very decent pet and it is also the one that I am currently using in PvP and War vs. World, so if you have any desire to play any of these two game modes, you can be using this one specific pet. Now, I have gone over every single one of the pets that I thought was relevant to show you both for Ranger, Druid and for Soul Beast, and we're gonna be having a look shortly into another wholly different matter, which is the individual DPS of pets. Because merging with your pets to deal damage is one thing, always believing that the Lynx is higher target DPS is a thing as well. What truly is important is to test it out, and this is what we're going to be delving into right now. As promised, here is the second part of the video in which we're going to be going over the DPS that the pets can do for each of the pets that will have selected based on their potential in actual fractal or raid plays. As such, I'm not going to be focusing on every single one pet, for example, I'm not going to look at what DPS a pig can do, because what truly really interests us is the pets that already have seen some usage in the regular PvE content and what they can do by themselves, that is to say, what are you losing when you swap from one pet to the other, what are you losing when you go to that CC pet while you were doing your DPS rotation and in the end is there really any reason to blame having to play the ranger for a DPS loss. So first of all it is important to outline that there are some specific abilities that affect the pet damage. For example there are weapon skills that can do exactly this. This one, for example, the crippling shot, gives the pets three attacks with bleeding. You also have some specific skills out there that can have an impact on your pet. For example, this healing skill shares your boons with the pets. You also have some uh, skills such as the uh, signet of the hunt that uh, gives you and your pet unblockable attacks. If you use Sikkim, you augment the DPS of your pet and as such we will avoid using any of these in the benchmarks we're going to be doing for the pets. We're going to keep it so that every single one of them only has the base boons that it could be getting in raids. We're not going to go for the idea that it would get alacrity, not go for the idea that we would be buffing them or anything. We're just going to go for the simplest stuff. It's also worth noting that there are some traits that have effects on the pets. For example, this one after swapping pets, the first first attack is poison. You also have some other effects that can have an impact on their DPS and we will be trying not to trigger any of these by keeping just one pet, giving it the boon and watching it deal damage to 1 million HP golem. After a solid minute of pet damage, I think we'll have a pretty good idea of where the pet's DPS stands. So we're gonna be doing this for the DPS pets and hopefully we're gonna be seeing some pretty decent benchmarks from them. And do note that if you've seen people in raids that have less DPS than what the pets are gonna be getting there, it's probably time to take a break. So yeah. I've given myself the basic rotation realistic boons. I'm gonna be copying them to the pets and we're gonna be testing the pets this way. So we're just gonna go in order. The first one we're gonna go for will be the Jovenine Jungle Stalker. So we're gonna summon an enemy golem. We're gonna put that at 1 million HP. We're gonna give it all the conditions and we are gonna be copying my boons to my pet. So now let's, let's have this little fella bench. I'm gonna be going for a specific chat in which we're gonna be able to, uh, to see. Wow, Subi kicked me. That's, that's pretty horrible. We're gonna be able to see the, the pets dealing damage over there. So, Might Spencer, there you go. I'm also gonna be using the F2 skill when it is a damaging one on cooldown. And if it is not a damaging one, I'm simply not gonna be using it. So there we go, I think that this is pretty clear. This pet has a DPS of 2k, more or less. And we're now gonna be swapping the pets around so that we can try more of them. The second pet we're gonna be testing out will be the Lynx. For the Lynx I will be using the F2 skill on cooldown because this is what you would be doing in a raid. So we're gonna summon another enemy golem at 1 million HP. We're gonna put all the conditions on them. We're gonna adjust the pet, give it all the boons and send him out.
The Lynx seems to stand at 2.3k, which is much better than the Prus pet we've been testing. However, this is still not particularly outstanding. Like, the DPS is relatively similar and only pulls ahead because of that F2 skill and the Blaze it gives. Now, we're going to be going over the Tiger. We're skipping over the Jaguar because the DPS is going to be relatively close to what we've seen on the first two. We're going to go for the Tiger because that one sees a lot of plays in party that are not able to sustain their own fury. So, that is our next plan. So at 2.1k, this pet is slightly above the Juvenile Jungle Stalker, however it is still not the best pet you can go for DPS, as can clearly be seen. However, if you're truly lacking Fury in your subgroup, it is a good idea to take this pet because as you can see, you're not exactly losing out on any damage. So now we're just going to be skipping ahead and going for the other pets that might seem to be a decent idea. So for example, the Bristleback. Like, this is not a good DPS pet unless it has Alacrity for the F2 skill, but it is still mildly decent when it comes to damage. We're going to have a look at what it can do. And we're done! This pet is getting 2.1k DPS which places it about at the same tier as the tiger. So despite the very good burst at the start, this pet can only go so far. Now, I am not saying that it is bad to use, I'm just saying that you should be limiting it to the precast. So you meld with it, get your sharpening stone, you meld out, replace it with a proper DPS pet and do your rotation. For the next pet we're going to be going over, we're going to swap this one over to the Jacaranda. Because the smoke scale is not exactly going to be a pet that I think will be good in a, in a testing environment. So we're just going to be using the Jacaranda. This appears to be the superior pet when it comes to damage. I would also like to add that this pet is even better than it might seem right now because this cold lightning ability actually cleaves. This is pretty good and as such it makes it a very good DPS pet. For the last DPS pet we're going to be testing we're going to go for the Fangli Boga and the Rock Gazelle. So the Rock Gazelle I'm not sure is going to have any good DPS but we're going to test it either way and the Fangli Boga. I have some pretty pretty hefty expectations for this one so let's see how it plays out. So it seems to be having 2.25k. Now this is not a good test for this pet because the conditions that it applies which are mostly leading, torment and confusion are tied to the enemy moving or using skills at least for torment and confusion. That means that this benchmark of the specific pet is not realistic at all. On any target that would be moving or using skill the damage would be exponentially greater. As such I believe that the Boga is probably the best pet to use in a single target fight against an enemy that moves or uses skills. For anything that is cleave related, we've seen that the Jacaranda was pretty strong. Now for our last test, we're gonna be going over the Rock Gazelle. Then I will be giving a spin to the two crowd control pets because in my opinion they deserve a little bit of lore as well.
Standing at 1.7k, this is the lowest DPS pet we've tested thus far. However, it has a CC skill that is pretty hefty on a 20 second timer. This means that technically this pet could well be a replacement for CC pets. That is the reason why we're now going to be testing the Electric Wyvern as well as the Pink Moa. As we can see, this pet has a DPS of 1.7k as well. It is not particularly good, and as I have told you earlier on, there is a reason as to why we swap it usually with the Juvenile Pink Moa, that is because the CC skill is not exactly good at hitting the target. We've seen it happen a few times over there, where the lightning field and the CC was happening much further than the target itself. So now we're going to be swapping it out with the Juvenile Pink Moa in an attempt to show people what the Juvenile Pink Moa can get by itself. With a DPS of barely 1k, this is by far the worst pet we have benched today. This means that if we have a pet that can do similar break bar damage or better, it would definitely replace this one. I believe that the Gazelle is a good contender, however I have not been given an opportunity to test out the exact break bar damage that these two do in order to compare them, but with the cooldown on the Gazelle being much shorter, it could be better in some encounters where you get more frequent break bars, or where you do not want to be running double CC pet. Now, I am not exactly sure that it is good per se, however, the testing of today gives us a pretty hefty idea of how the pets are broken down amongst themselves. In my opinion, it all comes down to whatever your team will need at a specific moment, however, you always should be looking at what you're performing by yourself. You are part of the backbone of the team as a soul beast, you're dealing damage and providing some utility and you should be trying to do your best in these two fields. Now, I hope that you guys have found this entire video, which was rather long, interesting or at least helpful for your daily ranger slash druid slash soul beast needs. If you have any question, you are more than welcome to ask them in the comment section of the video or directly on our discord, the link being in the description. If you want to support this channel, the most simple thing that you can do is to like the video and subscribe. If you want to go further, a donation link is in the description as well as a Patreon link. Then, if you want to see more of my content, you can also head over to my Twitch stream. It is on usually on Friday and Sundays, and if you have any question about Soul Beast, you can also ask them here, and if I see what you have written, I will be answering it. Now, I hope that every single one of you is gonna have a wonderful time playing around with their pets and have a lot of fun.